Hello there. I'm Glenna Coleman, Youth Services Librarian at the Wethersfield Proctor Library. And here's our library bear bear. We are here to read you a couple of stories that have something to do, in one way or another, with rocks. <laughs> our first story about rocks is called A Chip Off the Old Block. This story is by Jody Jensen Schaffer, or maybe Schaefer, and it is illustrated by Danielle Myers. A chip off the old block. A chip off the old block by Jody Jensen Schaefer, illustrated by Daniel Miares. Rocky was part of a great big family. Tons of his relatives were rock stars. Aunt Etna, Uncle Gibraltar, Mom and Dad, Great Grandma Half Dome, my cousins, the Wave, Dino, the Tower, and Rushmore. He loved when his parents told him about the most remarkable ones. Uncle Gibraltar ruled over massive ships and huge oceans. Aunt Etna could put on a light show that, like no one else. And Great Grandma Half Dome lived just a stone's throw away. I want to do something important too, said Rocky. But you're just a pebble, said his mom. A chip off the old block, said his dad. But inside, Rocky was a boulder. He was little, but he knew he could do big things. That night, after his parents went to bed, Rocky made his plan. I'll join my cousins and become part of one of the most amazing formations on Earth. The next morning, Rocky hopped a ride to Arizona. He landed with a thunk. Rocky was just settling in with his cousin, the wave, when a strong wind whisked him away. Whoa! Dude, shouted his cousin, way to catch some air. Rocky tossed and tumbled. And when he landed, he noticed a piece of him had broken off. Oh no, I hope I'm still big enough to make a difference. Rocky was smaller, but he remembered another relative who stood tall. So he caught a ride to Wyoming. Rocky landed with a thud. He had almost anchored himself to his towering cousin when a storm rolled in and washed him away. Whoosh! Help! Rocky gurgled. Enjoy the ride, Rocky! His cousin yelled back. It was clear that the two of them didn't share the same sediment. <laughs> Rocky swooped and bounced until he hit a tree. Thwack! And landed on a car. I know I can still matter, he said. I can be big with my cousins in Texas. After a long trip south, Rocky landed with a plop. I'll safeguard these ancient sauropod tracks, he said. Rocky was doing a great job until an armadillo sent him skipping. Yikes! Rocky was disappointed, but he was still ready to roll. He set his sights on South Dakota. Rocky bumped and bounced all the way to Mount Rushmore. He landed with a plonk. I may be tiny, but I can still rock a souvenir stand. He was surveying his surroundings when he overheard a worker. Sorry, folks, park is closed. Lincoln's nose is cracked. Rocky was crushed. He had traveled so far, searched so hard, lost so much mass. Now I'll never be great like my relatives. Then he looked up. Something about that majestic mountain reminded him what he was made of. Cousin Rushmore may be monumental, but everybody needs a little help sometimes. Rocky hitched a ride to the top, climbed out for a better look, and jumped. Rock and roll! Rocky
He dove over Lincoln's hair, somersaulted past Lincoln's forehead, surfed between Lincoln's eyebrows, and landed... Plunk! In the crack in Lincoln's nose, he was a perfect fit. I did it! I did something important! I saved Abraham Lincoln! Solid, said his cousin. Workers hugged, reporters snapped pictures, and Mount Rushmore opened as usual. All thanks to Rocky, the little pebble that wouldn't be taken for granted. Well, I hope you enjoyed Chip Off the, uh, Chip Off the Old Block by Jody Jensen Schaeffer. Uh, that's illustrated by Daniel Niares. Well, that's one story about a pebble. And here's another. This one is called Sylvester and the Magic Pebble. And this is by William Stieg. Sylvester and the Magic Pebble by William Stieg. Sylvester Duncan lived with his mother and father at Acorn Road in Oatsdale. One of his hobbies was collecting pebbles of unusual shape and color. On a rainy Saturday during vacation, he found a quite extraordinary one. It was flaming red, shiny, and perfectly round, like a marble. As he was studying this remarkable pebble, he began to shiver, probably from excitement, and the rain fell cold on his back. I wish it would stop raining, he said. To his great surprise, the rain stopped. It didn't stop gradually as rains usually do. It ceased. The drops va vanished on the way down. The clouds disappeared. Everything was dry and the sun was shining. As if rain had never existed. In all his young life, Sylvester had never had a wish gratified so quickly. It struck him that magic must be at work and he guessed that the magic must be in the remarkable looking red pebble, where indeed it was. To make a test, he put the pebble on the ground and said, I wish it would rain again. Nothing happened. But when he said the same thing, holding the pebble in his hoof, the sky turned black. There was lightning and a clap of thunder, and the rain came shooting down. What a lucky day this is, thought Sylvester. From now on, I can have anything I want. My father and mother can have anything they want. My relatives, my friends, and anybody at all can have everything anybody wants. He watched the sunshine. He wished the sunshine back in the sky, and he wished a wart on his left hind fetlock would disappear, and it did. And he started home, eager to amaze his father and mother with his magic pebble. He could hardly wait to see their faces. Maybe they wouldn't even believe him at first. As he was crossing Strawberry Hill, thinking of some of the many, many things he could wish for, he was startled to see a mean, hungry lion looking right at him from behind some tall grass. He was frightened. If he hadn't been so frightened, he could have made the lion disappear, or he could have wished himself safe at home with his father and mother. But... Uh, he couldn't have wished he could have wished the lion would turn him into a would turn into a buttercup or a daisy or a gnat. He could have wished many things, but he panicked and couldn't think carefully. I wish I were a rock, he said, and he became a rock. The lion came bounding over, sniffed at the rock a hundred times, walked around and around it, and went away confused, perplexed, puzzled, and bewildered. I saw that little donkey as clear as day. Maybe I'm going crazy, he muttered. And there was Sylvester, a rock on Strawberry Hill, with the magic pebble lying right beside him on the ground, and he was unable to pick it up. Oh, how I wish I were myself again, he thought, but nothing happened. He had to be touching the pebble to make the magic work, but there was nothing he could do about it. 
His thoughts began to race like mad. He was scared and worried. Being helpless, he felt hopeless. He imagined all the possibilities, and eventually he realized that his only chance of becoming himself again was for someone to find the red pebble and to wish that the rock next to it would be a donkey. Someone would surely find the red pebble. It was so bright and shiny. But what on earth would make them wish that a rock were a donkey? The chance was one in a billion at best. Sylvester fell asleep. What else could he do? Night came with many stars. Meanwhile, back at home, Mr. and Mrs. Duncan paced the floor, frantic with worry. Sylvester had never come home later than dinner time. Where could he be? They stayed up all night, wondering what had happened, expecting that Sylvester would surely turn up by morning. But he didn't, of course. Mrs. Duncan cried a lot, and Mr. Duncan did his best to soothe her. Both longed to have their dear son with them. "'I will never scold Sylvester again as long as I live,' said Mrs. Duncan." no matter what he does. At dawn, they went about inquiring of all the neighbors. They talked to all the children, the puppies, the kittens, the colts, the piglets. No one had seen Sylvester since the day before yesterday. They went to the police. The police could not find their child. All the dogs in Oatsdale went searching for him. They sniffed behind every rock and tree and blade of grass into every nook and gully of the neighborhood and beyond, but found not a scent of him. They sniffed the rock on Strawberry Hill, but it smelled like a rock. It didn't smell like Sylvester. After a month of searching the same places over and over again and inquiring of the same animals over and over again, Mr. and Mrs. Duncan no longer knew what to do. They concluded that something dreadful must have happened and that they would probably never see their son again. Though all the time he was less than a mile away. They tried their best to be happy, to go about their usual ways, but their usual ways included Sylvester, and they were always reminded of him. They were miserable. Life had no meaning for them anymore. Then it was winter. The winds blew this way and that. It snowed. Mostly, the animals stayed indoors, living on the food they had stored up. One day, a wolf sat on the rock that was Sylvester and howled and howled because he was hungry. Then the snows melted. The earth warmed up in the spring and the spring sun and things budded. Leaves were on the trees again. Flowers showed their young faces. One day in May, Mr. Duncan insisted that his wife go with him on a picnic. Let's cheer up, he said. Let us try to live again and be happy, even though Sylvester, our angel, is no longer with us. They went to Strawberry Hill. Mrs. Duncan sat down on the rock. The warmth of his own mother sitting on him woke Sylvester up from his deep winter sleep. How he wanted to shout, Mother, Father, it's me, Sylvester, I'm right here. But he couldn't. He had no voice. He was stone dumb. Dumb, of course, means not able to talk. Mr. Duncan walked aimlessly about while Mrs. Duncan set out the picnic food on the rock. Alfalfa sandwiches, pickled oats, sassafras salad, Timothy compote. Suddenly, Mr. Duncan saw the red pebble. What a fantastic pebble, he exclaimed. Sylvester would have loved it for his collection. He put the pebble on the rock. They sat down to eat. Sylvester was now as wide awake as a donkey that was a rock could possibly be. Mrs. Duncan felt some mysterious excitement. You know, Father, she said suddenly, I have the strangest feeling that our dear Sylvester is still alive and not far away. I am, I am, Sylvester wanted to shout, but he couldn't, if only... He had realized that the pebble resting on his back was the magic pebble. Oh, how I wish he were here with us on this lovely May day, said Mrs. Duncan. Mr. Duncan looked sadly at the ground. Don't you wish it too, father? She said. He looked at her as if to say, how can you ask such a question? Mr. and Mrs. Duncan looked at each other with great sorrow. 
I wish I were myself again. I wish I were my real self again, thought Sylvester. And in less than an instant, he was. You can imagine the scene that followed. The embraces, the kisses, the questions, the answers, the loving looks, and the fond exclamations. When they had eventually calmed down a bit and had gotten home, Mr. Duncan put the magic pebble in an iron safe. Some day he might want to use it, but really, for now, what more could they wish for? They all had all that they wanted. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed the story of Sylvester and the Magic Pebble by William Stieg. They were two very different pebbles in those stories, weren't they? Well, I'm Glenna Coleman, Youth Services Librarian at the Weathersfield Proctor Library. And this is our library bear bear. We hope you enjoyed today's stories and come back for another episode.